Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you uh, this morning to our midweek video, our Thursday morning video. We're glad that you have tuned in with us here. Also want to welcome you to our uh, Grace Life Bible YouTube channel here. If you haven't already done so, I'd like to encourage you to, to hit the subscribe and ring the alarm bell so that you can stay current with the ministry when we go live from the assembly building on Sunday mornings, as well as when we create content uh, midweek here from our office. Appreciate you tuning in as always. Glad to have you here. Our featured book uh, from now till Easter is my book, Don't Pass Over Easter, A New Defense of Easter in Acts 12.4. I wrote this book uh, two years ago, right as COVID was breaking. This book was published by Dispensational Publishing House, and it covers the widely discussed and debated uh, reading in the King James Bible in Acts 12.4 about the word Easter which is very heavily discussed and debated usually around this time of year. So if you're interested in learning more about that verse in the King James Bible, I would encourage you to pick up this book, Don't Pass Over Easter, A New Defense of Easter in Acts 12.4, and uh, check out that information. also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here. We established this last year in 2021 as an alternative to YouTube. Should something happen to our YouTube ministry, just as a... Um, move to try to be prepared in case uh, something were to happen to us on YouTube. And we're currently up to 195. It'd be great to get this up to 200 by the, by next week when I do a video. But we appreciate those of you who have subscribed to us on Rumble as well. So what am I going to talk about in this lesson? I'm actually going to talk about something that was shared with me this past week. Um, one of the listener, one of our listeners and fellow researchers that uh, follows this channel uh, who I appreciate is a gentleman named Christopher Yetzer. And he sent me something last week, and I was really surprised to, to see what it was that he sent me. And it's related to my book, The King James Bible in America, an orthographic historical and textual investigation. So this is a book that I wrote in 2019, and it talks about, as the title suggests, it, it looks at four pairs of words as a way of framing a conversation about the printed history of the King James text in the United States. And that's, that's what the book was about. And in the second half of the book, in the first half of the book, I deal with these four pairs of words, thoroughly, throughly, always, always, establish, establish, and end sample and example. To, as a way of then framing a conversation in the later latter half of the book, the second half, about issues related to the copyright myth on the King James Bible, and then how that impacted the, the American printings uh, here in North America after the colonists secured independence from Great Britain. And so that's what the book is about. Um, in 2020, the book was critiqued by Rodney Boulier out of Connecticut, uh, which prompted me to make this uh, playlist here um, on the King James Bible in America. There's eight videos in this playlist where I'm responding to the uh, mischaracterizations and misinformation that Rodney presented uh, in his two critique videos. Um and one of the videos, number seven, it's covered a little bit here by my video window, is on the words thoroughly and throughly. And what was interesting is what Christopher sent me is something that I'd never seen before. And that is a British printing of the King James text that was changing the orthography or the spelling of some of these words. Now, it's commonly believed by many King James advocates that thoroughly, throughly are discriminated words of distinct meaning, and that if you change the way the word is spelled, you are substantively altering the content of the text. Now, what I argue in my book, The King James Bible in America, and what I demonstrate in the videos in this playlist is, it's just not true. Uh, they are spelling variants of each other. They are words of that basically carry the exact same meanings. And to alter the spelling is not to substantively change the text. Now, the reason why this is important is because in American printings, um, the orthography, the spelling of words was being changed from British printings to cohere with the way words were being spelled in the United States. And that's a big part of what I've talked about. Now, I've talked about this at length. I've talked about it at length in my book. 
and I've talked about it at length here in the playlist that I made. Now, what Christopher sent me was something that I had not seen before, and that is a British printing changing the spellings of or changing some orthography as far as how words are spelled. Okay. Now here's, here's what was sent to me. All right. Try to zoom in in this as much as I can. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that to go bigger, but here's second Timothy chapter three, verse 17 in this British printing. Notice it says that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly, thoroughly, not throughly standard printings, of the 1769 text, the British printing, spell that throughly, not thoroughly. Now, this particular one, this is the first time. So when he sent this to me, this is the first time that I'd ever seen a British printing that spelled the word as thoroughly, not throughly. All right. Now, this particular printing. So he, he sent this to me and then I was able to download the PDF. So here is the PDF for this particular edition that was sent to me. Uh, by Brother Yetzer, and we can look here and see that this truly is a British printing, and we can also look at the date, okay? Now, you got to do some uh, gymnastics here as far as your um, your uh, bone up, possibly, on your use of Roman numerals, but this is 1776. This is a 1776 British printing. It was printed at Birmingham, and this is a this is a King James text. This is the uh, the authorized version. And this is a so this is a British printing from 1776. And if we go back here, we can see very plainly that they have changed the way this word is spelled. Now, a change in spelling from throughly to thoroughly is not a word change, it's a spelling change. As I show in these videos and in the book, the orthographical, ch orthographical changes in spelling were already underway. Uh, at the time the King James Bible was done between 1604 and 1611. And we can see that by looking at the printed history of the text. And I cover all those points in these videos here in the playlist that I made in response to the critique. So what we have then here is a true British printing from Birmingham from 1776, where we can look and see that orthographical changes had already started to occur in British printings. Now they are minor, okay? There are very few orthographical changes uh, comparatively in British printings to what would happen in American printings, but they are, there are, they are still there. Now, again, I would ask the question, if you are a British person sitting in Great Britain in 1776 and you go to buy and you go to the store or wherever it is that you buy books or whatever bookshop, whatever, and you pick up a copy of this Bible printed at Birmingham in 1776 and you go look up a couple verses and you see that there's been some orthographical changes to the way something is spelled, are you going to be like, oh my word, I don't have the Bible, I need to go get a different one? I'm suggesting to you that that is not an idea that anybody in the English speaking world had um, until relatively recently. And it's not an idea anybody in the American uh, Christian, uh, the American space had. OK, it's an idea that we are that that advocates of the King James Bible today are are hanging back on people that they wouldn't have thought about it the way that that folks are, are thinking about it today. Now, the word throughly, the word throughly occurs 12 times in 11 verses in a standard um, printing of the King James, in the standard 17.9 King James Bible, all right? So what I want to do is I want to look at all 12 of these occurrences in this 17, 7, 1776 Bible printed at Birmingham, this British printing, and I want to see what we come up with. So understand, again... All the verses that we're about to look at are all throughly in a standard 1769 printing, okay? This particular printing is a 1776 printed at Birmingham, and we want to look at what happens, okay? So I'm going to be coming up here. I've, I've pre-written out all the page numbers we want to look at. The first one we want to look at is Genesis 11.3, okay? Genesis 11.3, right here. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick 
and burned them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. So here's a 1776 British printing that has changed throughly in this verse to thoroughly. Is this a corruption? Is this a substantive change to the text? Or is this just an orthographical change? To me, this is an orthographical change. This, this, but what it's showing you is that spelling changes were happening and that these spelling changes were not intended to change the substance of the text. We could go to the next one. We could go to Job chapter 6, verse 2. We could go to Job chapter 6, verse 2, and look at another example here. Okay, here's Job 6, verse 2. Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed and my calamity laid in the balances together. So here's another instance where a spelling change has occurred in a British printing from 1776. So again, these aren't American printings. This is a British printing that is altering some of these spellings, okay? We could go to Psalm 51, verse 2. We could go to Psalm 51, verse 2, and see it here. Now watch what happens on this one, okay? Uh, make sure I get the right verse here. Wash me throughly from my iniquity and, call, and, and cleanse me from my sin. So here the old spelling is retained. So this is telling us now that it's not consistent as far as the changes in the, in the orthography that were happening. Sometimes the... the, the um, Spelling is updated. Sometimes it's not. Thoroughly being the older form of thoroughly, as I demonstrated clearly, both in the book and in this playlist, uh, specifically number seven. Okay, so we can see that some of these spellings, some of these spellings are changed, and some of them are not. Let's also go, let's go to Jeremiah six, verse nine. Jeremiah six, verse nine, and we can look at that example also. In Jeremiah six, verse nine. Oops, must have entered that page number wrong. Um, bear with me here. Sorry about that. Let's see if we get the right one here. Okay, good. Jeremiah 6, verse 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly clean the remnant of Israel as a vine. So this time, it's the standard spelling. So we see a mixed bag. We could go to the very next chapter here which is the next page to get the next one, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 5. For if ye truly amend your ways and your doings, if ye truly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor. So those examples there are still using the old spelling, all right? But then we could go later in the book of Jeremiah, and we could see that it was changed in chapter 50, verse 30. Uh, we could see a change in chapter 50, verse 34, excuse me, verse 34, and we could see it right here. The Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He shall thoroughly plead their cause. So this time in this verse, the orthography has changed. Now look, folks, if... If these are substantive differences in meaning, and um, th then we then the British have all kinds of problems here now. Okay, they have all kinds of problems related to um, which one of these which one of these eight British AV printings is the authentic one. Is it the one that came off of the Cambridge Press in 1769? Is it the one that uh, is printed here by uh, in Birmingham in, in 1776? Is this an inauthentic printing? I mean, you have all manner of problems now that you're going to have where, and, and there's no evidence that the British people thought this way about their text uh, at the time. And so it's, it, it's not helpful to read modern debates in the 20th and 21st century back onto people uh, that there's no evidence ever thought about the text the way that we are thinking about the text today. And I'll add, the reason we're thinking about the text the way we are today is because of what has happened since 1881 with the publication of the Revised Version and Modern Versions and and the, the flux that the text has been thrown into as a result of modern debates about textual criticism and, and so forth. But we should not 
hang back on, we should not put back on people in bygone generations of the body of Christ, our current uh, debates and create problems, uh, in, problems for them that they never faced. Because the, the, the issues created by over-exaggerating and thinking that these are word changes that substantively alter the doctrinal content of the text versus simple spelling changes that, that are just different ways of saying the same thing are greater. And this is what I argued in my video series, especially in lesson eight, the conclusion is that we need to not, we, we need to, the principle that I've advocated for both in the book and in the video series is in my mind, a principle of least damage. It does the least damage to say that these are just um, spelling variants than it does to say that there were changes when you take into account the totality of the data at the time in the United States. But now the same problem exists in, Brit in Britain as well as this volume from Birmingham from 1776 uh, is showing us here. So I really appreciate that being shared this because uh, it's it's adding a new wrinkle to this whole conversation that I was not heretofore aware of. Let's go look at Ezekiel 16, verse 9. Ezekiel 16, verse 9. Let's go look at that one. Here it is. Then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. Again, spelling change, orthographical change. Traditional, thoroughly, thoroughly here in this particular British printing. We can also go now to the New Testament, and the first one we want to look at there is Matthew. Now, the, the ones in Matthew and Luke are interesting, and I'll try to explain to you why. Matthew, check, Matthew chapter 3, and we want verse 12. So this is when the uh, Pharisees and so forth come to John's baptism. Verse 12 whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So throughly, <coughs> excuse me, is retained. The traditional spelling there is retained. The older spelling is retained in, in um, Matthew in this uh, passage. But now if we go to Luke, it's interesting because we have a parallel passage in Luke where the spelling has been altered in this particular edition from 1776. And we need verse 17. So the context is the same. It's John talking here, okay? Um, and he's saying similar things to what he said in Matthew chapter 3. Look at verse 17. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and he will gather the wheat into the garner, but burn up, but the chaff will, will burn up with fire unquenchable, okay? So he's talking about the same thing. Um, he's, he's saying the same thing in a different way, but this time it's thoroughly, not throughly. So now you have a cross-reference in this particular edition where you have thoroughly, throughly being used interchangeably, folks. And what this shows you is that there's in, in the minds of the British at the time, there's no substantive difference in meaning between them because in Matthew 3, it's throughly. Here they've, they've, they've updated the orthography to thoroughly, which is the way the word is now spelled. And they're being used in the same context interchangeably. There's no perceived substantive difference in meaning in doing so. And then, of course, we have two examples in Paul's epistles, one from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 6. Um, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but though we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. So there again is the alteration in orthography to thoroughly, and then we could come in and see it again in the verse that we started in, which is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay. So the, the data here, as we've looked at it, is of the 12 occurrences in 11 verses of Thruly in a standard 1769 printing, this particular British edition from 1776 has retained, uh, has retained um, 
throughly, the old spelling, one, two, three, four, five times. So the majority of the occurrences have been changed or updated in their orthography to throughly. So my purpose in making the video is to, is to say that this, it, the same issues that I discussed in American printings when it comes to orthography uh, in, in both my book and in my eight part series of videos here, I'm going to put links both to the book where you can order it and to this series of videos into the description for this video extends now, not just to the situation in America, but it also extends to the, the situation in Britain. So we got to think long and hard about what we say about some of this stuff. And I know that my position is, is one that is suspicious in the minds of some King James advocates because it is different from what has traditionally or historically been said. However, no, I have yet to see Rodney's attempt to falsify the book was a miserable failure for a ton of reasons that I covered in the, uh, in the series of videos. And I have yet to see somebody make an argument that is coherent and consistent for why what I've argued is wrong. Okay. And now because of what brother Yetzer has shared with me, we see that this extends now beyond not just what was the situation in the United States, but also into Britain itself, the, 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 or the place of origin of the King James Bible. So there's a lot to ponder here. I believe that my position that I've argued for in the book, in the playlist, eight videos, and in this video as well, is a position of least damage. Um, so I commend this to you for your consideration. I hope that you'll check out possibly the book, if not the book for sure, this playlist, or eight part playlist where I, I go into all manner of uh, response to what was said about the book. So. If you have any comments or questions about this, uh, please leave them in the uh, in, in the comments. Please like and share this video if you uh, are so inclined. And I want to end here with a few reminders and with the gospel, the way that we uh, traditionally would end a video. I want to remind you about my video from last week, what I posted here about the complete notes, the Sonship Edification, tracing its origin and development within the Mid-Axe Grace Movement. This was the subject matter of my video from last week. I'm going to place a link in the description below to the playlist on Sonship, as well as to this document. Again, if anybody is interested in uh, picking this up and checking it out. I also want to remind everybody about the rebroadcasting of the Grace History Project here on this channel. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning at 9 o'clock, we are rebroadcasting the Grace History Project <clears throat> and developing a comprehensive playlist of the entire project. So by the end of the week, this week, we will be up to 62 videos in that playlist, tracing the um, abandonment and resurgence of Pauline truth. And we are right in the thick of it right now in the 1800s, looking at the resurgence of Pauline truth that was underway uh, through Darby and William Trotter. I'm, I'm teaching this week in, in the videos on when was the mystery no longer a mystery. So if you're interested at all in the history of dispensationalism, I encourage you to uh, check those videos out. In the descriptions for those videos, you'll find audio links, PDF note links, and if I have it, a link to the PowerPoint that I use to teach those lessons. So please consider checking out the Grace History Project if you haven't already done so. Also want to remind you about our ongoing project in the Adult Sunday School class at Grace Life Bible Church. From this generation forever, a study of God's promise to preserve his word. We've been at this now for a long time. I just taught Lesson 172 this past Sunday on BOD 1602 and uh, its impact on the readings of the Old Testament. Uh, so BOD 1602 is an annotated bishop's Bible with the handwritten notes of the translators written in the margin and the interlinear lines. And so we're, we're really starting uh, to pick up steam on looking at that document. So if you're interested in, the, in, in that, we would consider, uh, ask you to consider checking that out. Also want to remind you about our podcast that I have with my wife, the Just Grace Hit podcast with Brian and Becky Ross. We do have a new episode dealing with personal verbal attacks in ministry, personal verbal attacks in ministry. 
Uh, this just uh, released earlier this week. So if you haven't done so, we uh, ask you to consider checking that out. And then Grace Life Bible Church in 2022 is doing the Bible reading challenge through Paul's epistles, where we are reading as a church every month through Paul's epistles. Uh, this has been a great blessing for me personally, uh, and as well as people who are sharing with me their experiences in doing this. And uh, it's just it's just been a great edifying thing uh, it, for, for me personally and for our entire assembly. If you're interested in joining us in reading through Paul's epistles throughout the duration of 2022, you check out this page here on our church website. There's a couple videos explaining the premise. And then there is also a couple different reading plans for you to check out and some links to King James Readers Bibles uh, if you are interested in picking one up. Folks, we go live every Sunday morning from the church building at 9 a.m. and about 1040 with Adult Sunday School in our main service. You can pick us up here on YouTube in our live stream. You could also pick us up on Facebook, both on my personal page and on the church's uh, uh, group page or, or um, the church page. And we just added this this year in 2022. You can also pick us up live right here on our on our church homepage. By clicking on live stream and um, this is just a new avenue to check us out and uh, join us live if you're so inclined before you go the most important thing in all the world is your salvation and your justification if you've never trusted Jesus Christ if you've never relied exclusively on his shed blood for you on the cross his burial and his resurrection from the dead is the only total complete payment for your sin you need to trust the gospel today. You need to believe that Christ died, in your, died on the cross for your sin, was buried and rose again. When you believe that message, you'll receive forgiveness of sins as a free gift. You'll receive justification, eternal life. You'll be taken out from under the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. We're not guaranteed tomorrow, folks. None of us know how long we have on planet Earth until our time is up. Trust Jesus Christ. Trust the gospel of Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention. We'll see you next time.